chlorectomies, an act of compassion or the work of Satan? I'm arguing for the pro will be Dr. Jerry Sabag from California. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and state that I have no relevant financial disclosures. I also um, propose that following this presentation, you'll all agree that vitrectomy cures floaters safely and effectively. But not all floaters are created equal. The term vision-degrading myodysopsia is coined to refer to clinically significant vitreous floaters. And this is not an arbitrary designation, but it's defined with objective quantitative evaluations of vitreous structure, that being quantitative ultrasonography, and visual function. Not visual acuity, but contrast sensitivity. And that's what we've determined is most affected by opacities in the vitreous. Posterior vitreous attachment is the leading cause of vision-degrading myodysopsia. An AJO publication in 2016, which was prospective, showed that there was more than 50% degradation in contrast sensitivity following a PVD. Furthermore, after the PVD, there's continued increased density of the vitreous, uh, further impacting on vision. Myopic vitreopathy is the second leading cause, typically in younger individuals, and a publication last year in the AJO showed that there's a correlation between the degree of axial myopia shown on the x-axis in the middle graph and the degree of vitreous density shown on the y-axis, so that the greater the axial length, the worse the density of the vitreous. The very worst individuals have both myopic vitreopathy and posterior vitreous detachment. But there are visual consequences to this increased density. This graph shows the relationship between contrast sensitivity on the x-axis, where the higher the number, the worse the contrast sensitivity, and vitreous density on the y-axis with quantitative ultrasonography. And as you can see, the more dense the vitreous, the worse the contrast sensitivity. Armed with these two clinical metrics of severity, we can characterize patients as mild, moderate, or severe and offer them treatment. Our treatment of choice is limited vitrectomy using sutureless technique with 25 gauge instrumentation and not inducing a PVD if there isn't one preoperatively. This is to decrease the risk of iatrogenic retinal breaks and retinal detachments, but also mitigate against cataract formation, which is further prevented by leaving three or four millimeters of gel vitreous intact behind the lens because it contains the antioxidants that work against the reactive oxygen species that induce cataract formation. Here you can see the effects of limited vitrectomy on contrast sensitivity. On the y-axis is the Weber index, where the higher the number, the worse the contrast sensitivity. In comparison to 70 H-match controls without floaters, 139 individuals with bothersome floaters had an average degradation in contrast sensitivity of 91.3%. Within one week of limited vitrectomy, every case was normal, and the contrast sensitivity remained normal for months and years thereafter. In terms of complications, a series of 195 cases followed for an average of 32 months, 50 of them followed for more than four years, had no evidence of endophthalmitis or glaucoma. Vitreous hemorrhage occurred in two cases. It cleared spontaneously, did not require intervention. Retinal breaks in three cases and retinal detachments in three cases, all identified and treated successfully. Three patients lost vision, two due to central retinal artery occlusion. These were older individuals who had hypertension, and one had an optic neuropathy. Cataract surgery was performed in 16% of cases, an average of 13 months after the limited vitrectomy, the mean age of these individuals was 64. No one under the age of 53 required cataract surgery. Not only is this clinically effective, but limited vitrectomy is cost effective. A study done in collaboration with Gary Brown showed that the cost utility ratio of limited vitrectomy was superior to cataract surgery, amblyopia therapy, and retinal detachment repair. So in conclusion, patients with vision degrading myodysopsy have greater vitreous equidensity, and more degradation in contrast sensitivity than controls. Limited vitrectomy reduces vitreous equidensity and improved contrast sensitivity in all patients, even those with multifocal IOLs, which we published earlier this year. Thus, limited vitrectomy is a clinically proven and cost-effective cure for vision-degrading myodysopsia, 
and I hope you will all agree. Thank you. For the kind discussion, we're pleased to welcome Michael Cohen from Will's Eye Hospital. Hey, thanks.